For many of us, we cannot fully comprehend the possible chaos that a hacker organization could cause on our daily lives. I believe the reason for this is that there are two points in time in how we understand or conceptualize the internet. The first being when it's new to us, likely as children or early adults. Using the internet at this time is like gazing into an endless ocean of wonder and possibility. We're so overwhelmed by the cool things that we can do, we're unlikely to notice just how deep it really is. As we know, the deeper the ocean, the darker the depths. As we get older, the internet becomes second nature. It isn't even a thought, just a part of your everyday life that we use so easily, and there's no real reason to dig too deep into what we're being protected from. But whether we think about it matters not to the reality. There exist groups that operate in these depths, who, given the opportunity, can and will topple financial systems, hospitals, power grids, really any form of core infrastructure that we rely on each day. Some of these groups exist to enrich themselves, some of them exist to stick it to the man. Some of them, however, are state-sanctioned and could have much more nefarious goals. Today, we're going to talk about one such group known as Lazarus, though they have many names depending on who you talk to and which point in history you want to reference. Microsoft refer to them as Zinc, the United States intelligence community refer to them as Hidden Cobra, and according to a North Korean defector, they are known internally as 414 Liaison Office. This group have been responsible for hacks that are traced all the way back to 2009, but some believe it goes back further. They are still active as of 2022, and while the information regarding the group is sparse, there is enough to make for an interesting overview. The earliest known attack that many security experts believe traced back to this group is known as Operation Troy, and it began on July 4th, 2009. The target of Operation Troy was the United States and the South Korean government. The attack utilized distributed denial of service, more commonly referred to as DDoS, and the first wave began in the US, targeting the White House, the Pentagon, the Washington Post, the Nasdaq, Amazon, and the New York Stock Exchange. Coincidentally, this attack began on the same day that North Korea was testing ballistic missile launchers, and then three days later on July 7th, the attack shifted focus to South Korea, targeting multiple intelligence and security services with varying degrees of success. On July 9th, the attacks continued on South Korean National Intelligence Services, one of their largest banks and a major news agency, as well as simultaneously the United States Department of Homeland Security website. This attack was classified as cyber espionage and despite being called unsophisticated, did cause issues and more importantly concern for the coordination of the events. The next major attack occurred in 2011, again on South Korean media, financial and critical infrastructure. This would later be labeled 10 Days of Rain. They again used compromised computers within South Korea to create a botnet, harnessing their resources to overwhelm the targets. As the name suggests, this denial of service lasted for 10 days, and according to McAfee Labs targeted 40 sites affiliated with South Korean government, including the US Air Force Base located in Kusan. 14 of these targets were the same as in the 2009 attacks, but nearly all of the US-based targets such as the White House, State Department, FAA and FTC were removed from the target list this time around. The attack was described as unusually destructive for typical botnet attacks. The relentless DDoS ended with the machines destroying themselves by overwriting all files with zeros and then zeroing out the master boot record, which renders the computer unbootable. This attack, unlike the 2009 Operation Troy, was described as incredibly sophisticated, akin to bringing a Lamborghini to a go-kart race. The prevailing thought is that it was not without aim, but instead to test the cyber defenses and reaction times of the South Korean government, as cyberspace had already become the fifth battle space dimension, in addition to land, air, sea, and space. By March 20th, 2013, Operation Dark Soul occurred. The progression of these attacks would become apparent, and they were much, much more sophisticated than anything the group had used previously. There was clear progression, not only in the method of attack, but also in the ambition. Six organizations were targeted, and while they originally thought it was another DDoS, they would soon find that they were infected with malicious code. This code damaged 32,000 computers and servers of media and financial companies, 
temporarily paralyzing branches of certain banks as the code was responsible for erasing hard drives and blocking internet access. Experts estimate that this attack caused $750 million in economic damages alone, and while originally this was attributed to two other groups known as New Romantic Cyber Army Team and Who Is Team, researchers have since discovered that Lazarus was the supergroup at the helm of it all. Just three months later, the June 25th cyber terror attack occurred. This was an information leak that targeted the Chiang Wai Day, also known as the Blue House, which is the multi-building complex traditionally housing the President of the Republic of Korea. When connecting to the official Blue House website, users were greeted with the words, quote, The great Kim Jong-un. All hail the unified chairman Kim Jong-un. Until our demands are met, our attacks will continue. Greet us. We are anonymous. This came alongside a photo of Park Yun hae who was currently South Korea's president. The official report claims that this hack resulted in the leak of over 220,000 people, including 100,000 ordinary citizens and over 20,000 military personnel, including their name, birthday, ID, address, and IP address. The hackers, however, claimed a significantly higher number of stolen details, stating 2.5 million party members, 300,000 soldiers, 100,000 website users, and 40,000 United States Forces Korea members. This was clearly a hack to deliver a message, as it happened on the 63rd anniversary of the Korean War. The next attack had a similar goal, but an altogether different target. Although the exact hack date is unknown due to the group stealing information for months, on November 24th, 2014, a hacker group calling themselves Guardians of Peace leaked confidential data from the Sony Pictures film studio. This included information about Sony Pictures employees and their families, emails between employees, executive salaries, copies of unreleased Sony films, plans for future films, scripts, and more. They also erased part of Sony's computer infrastructure on the way out. This hack was more serious than anyone initially knew, including 47,000 unique social security numbers, names and addresses. Though the media mostly focused on the scandalous emails that resulted in some resignations where things like racism were prevalent in said emails. On December 16th, a few weeks after the initial leak, the Guardians of Peace made demands and threats. Quote, we will clearly show it to you at the very time and places. The interview be shown, including the premiere, how bitter fate those who seek fun in terror should be doomed to. Soon, all the world will see what an awful movie Sony Pictures Entertainment has made. The world will be full of fear. Remember the 11th of September 2001, we recommend you to keep yourself distant from the place at that time. If your house is nearby, you'd better leave. Whatever comes in the coming days is called by the greed of Sony Pictures Entertainment. All the world will denounce the Sony. This is of course in reference to the likely cause of the hack, The Interview, a comedy movie that revolves around the assassination of the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un. In response to this, the Sony CEO pressured the studio to soften the assassination scene and also to skip a large part of the release rollout, in part due to the threat and in others due to the major cinemas refusing to show the film. The next operation that is credited to this group is the Bangladesh bank robbery, occurring sometime between February 4th and 5th, 2016, when the banks were closed for the weekend. Hackers gained access to the network, observed how transactions functioned, and then gained access to the credentials required to make their own payment transfers. Using this access, they made roughly three dozen requests to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Roughly 30 of these transactions, totaling $851 million, were flagged for staff review, but five, five were granted. $20 million was sent to the Shalika Foundation, which was a Sri Lanka-based private limited company, although the transfer contained a spelling error, which resulted in it being flagged and halted by a routing bank. The other four transfers was $81 million, which was sent to the Philippines, split across five different private accounts that were set up with false identities. Now, looking into the Sri Lankan transfer, the local authorities investigated why this foundation was the intended recipient of funds 
and this was a weird rabbit hole to stumble down in pursuit of the story. To simplify everything, essentially the foundation owner claims to have been set up by an acquaintance who was in contact with a Japanese middleman that would allegedly be giving them $20 million to develop a power plant in Sri Lanka through the foundation, despite never having any dealings with them before. Though as the investigation progressed, the bank officials claimed that the foundation owner left instructions with the bank to transfer $7.72 million to their personal account and $11.1 million to an account controlled by her acquaintance once the transaction had cleared, which does seem to condemn her initial story that she was set up and had no idea this was going on. As for the $81 million that went to the five accounts in the Filipino-based bank, Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation, or RCBC for short, the money was then transferred to a foreign exchange broker, converted to Filipino local currency, and then transferred back to RCBC and consolidated into the single account of a Chinese Filipino businessman. Before anybody could put a stop to these transfers, $58 million was transferred out and then laundered through casinos and transferred through Hong Kong. To date, the Bangladesh bank was only able to recover around $15 million of these funds and the RCBC was subject to a $53 million fine for non-compliance with banking laws and regulations in connection with the bank robbery. A manager of the bank was also jailed for four to seven years, and some believe the bank was complicit in this robbery. And just to touch upon the forward thinking of events like this, the four US dollar accounts at the RCBC were actually made almost an entire year earlier on May 15th, 2015, remaining completely untouched until they were transferred money from the Bangladesh bank robbery. Moving forward now to May 2017, the Lazarus Group made their next move, the WannaCry ransomware attack. Unlike previous operations, this was not an attack on a single company, a single institute, or even a single country, but one that was aimed at the entire world. This ransomware crypto worm targeted computers running Windows operating system, and once infected, would self-replicate, try to spread through the network, encrypt your data, and essentially lock you out of your machine while demanding payments in Bitcoin cryptocurrency. This worm was initially released in Asia on May 12th, 2017, and infected 230,000 computers in 150 countries within 24 hours. The worm used the Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar exploits to attack unpatched computers, these being exploits that the United States National Security Agency, NSA for short, had developed with the purpose of using them as cyber weapons instead of reporting the vulnerability to Microsoft. These exploits were then stolen by Russian hacker group Shadow Brokers and put up for auction. When no buyer was found, they instead decided to release them on the open market completely for free. Only after the theft did the NSA report the exploit for Microsoft to patch. Windows then pushed an optional update on March 14th, but many computers were still running on older Windows versions, as it again was optional, and they were susceptible to the worm. On one side of the scale, had Microsoft made this patch in a tree, the attack would likely have caused very little issue. On the other side, if this exploit was not known to Microsoft and they hadn't put any patch out whatsoever, the affected computer number could have easily been in the millions and the damage catastrophic. According to the public ledger that is the Bitcoin network, the wallet addresses used in this ransomware only managed to earn around $160,000 of Bitcoin according to the price at the current time, but the impact of the ransomware was much more severe than that number suggests. Hospitals in England were impacted disproportionately by the worm, resulting in them having to turn away non-critical emergencies and diverting ambulances. Up to 70,000 devices were inoperable, including computers, MRI scanners, blood storage refrigerators, and theater equipment. Regarding overall financial damages to companies and critical infrastructure, the dollar value is estimated anywhere between a few hundred million to four billion dollars, but indicates that it could have been vastly higher had the timeline been just a few weeks quicker. A British computer security researcher eventually received a copy of the virus and discovered a hard-coded kill switch, bringing the worm's brief chaotic life to an abrupt end. The virus constantly checked to see if a website was running and would only proceed if it was not. He identified the check, registered the domain to put the website live, and it immediately stopped propagating itself and infecting new machines. The unusual ease of disabling the worm led many to believe that the purpose was not to raise money, but instead to raise chaos. 
This was the start of North Korea's interest in stealing cryptocurrency, and later, in 2017, they continued with similar ransomware and phishing attacks targeting South Korean Bitcoin and Monero holders. They used exploits in South Korean word processing software, spear phishing attacks and malware to steal Korean students' email addresses and passwords. The conclusion of officials is that the group was targeting cryptocurrency, attempting to use it to circumvent international financial sanctions. They continued targeting crypto exchanges over the years, including stealing $7 million from Bitthumb, stealing 17% of assets from Ubit, another South Korean Bitcoin exchange that forced them into bankruptcy, and also went after NiceHash, a global cryptocurrency hash power broker and crypto exchange, stealing 4,700 Bitcoin, which at the time was worth $64 million, although would be close to $200 million as of today. The vulnerability in NiceHash was allegedly a spear phishing attack, which involves targeting a specific person or organization and then tailoring your communication, which increases the likelihood of success due to it usually containing personal information. Lazarus also went on to steal another $25 million from an Indonesian cryptocurrency company and $12 million from a financial services company in New York. As to where all this money went, you can look at the wallets and see that they painted a pretty picture. They sent hundreds of Bitcoin back and forth between hundreds of wallets and while I could follow it and could continue to follow it, it is an effort of futility for this story since we know who took it and why. Following these attacks, they took advantage of the global crisis in late 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic, starting to target and attack pharmaceutical companies, again using spear phishing techniques, posing as health officials and contacting company employees with malicious links. It is thought that many were targeted, but the only confirmed company was AstraZeneca. According to a report, a wide range of employees were targeted, including many involved in the COVID-19 vaccine research. In absence of a confirmed reason for these attacks, the following speculations were put forth as likely possibilities. Stealing sensitive information to be sold for profit, extortion schemes, and giving foreign regimes access to proprietary COVID-19 research. This brings us to the latest attack, and the one that prompted my interest in the story. The 2022 Ronin Bridge exploit, one of the largest attacks ever recorded, with $625 million at hack day valuation being stolen within minutes from the wallet of the largest play to earn game known as Axie Infinity. Since the hack, which happened on March 23rd, 2022, they have split up the money to be sent between many different wallets that have now been appropriately tagged with the note Lazarus Group North Korea, as well as sending tens of thousands of Ethereum meaning hundreds of millions of dollars, to the popular money laundering app called Tornado.cash. This money is unlikely to be recovered, and was only very recently confirmed by the FBI to be in the hands of Lazarus, bringing their grand total of stolen goods in the last decade to well over a billion dollars, and the damage caused by their attacks likely in the tens of billions of dollars, and that is just what is credited to the group, not mentioning many things that they also were likely involved with. This is one of many organizations that operate in this fashion, and I don't think it will be the last we see of them, especially not with the cryptocurrency industry being bigger than ever, and their apparent interest in taking advantage of that fact. Thank you very much for watching. Consider interacting with this video if you enjoyed it. A like, comment, subscribe, or a share goes a long way in getting more of these videos made and showing me what interests you. Patreon in the description if you want to support my delve into the rabbit hole further, and I'll see you next time.